Hello, and welcome to The Shakedown, where we talk about the criminal justice system from the inside out. Each week we discuss a question and talk about the criminal justice system and tell our stories relating to that topic. To start our podcast, we will be asking, who are we? My name is Ryan. I spent six years in Texas prisons, also known as TDCJ, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. But most inmates know it as TDC, Texas Department of Corrections, because that's the name they went by for the longest time. I spent six years there. I stayed in prisons across the state. I just last year got released on parole, um, which means um, I had a 10-year sentence, so I get to finish the rest of my four outside with, with some supervision. I also have 10 years of probation to do as well. I was allowed an interstate compact, which means I get to do my time outside of the state of Texas and in Colorado. While I was in prison, I also met Malone, who is here with me. Hi, that's my intro to come in, huh? Yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Aaron Malone. I also was in prison in, in uh, Texas for 30 years. I was locked up for murder in 1991 at the age of 17 and was recently released last year in April of 2021. I received a 50 year sentence. I did, as I said, 30 of it and I'm allowed to do the remainder of it the last 20 years out here in the free world. I'm currently on house arrest right now which means I have a GPS monitor on. So I'm not completely free. I still have one foot in prison, so to speak. I'm here because uh, Ryan and I both saw a need. We saw a, we saw a, a problem that no one is being, that no one is addressing, problems that are with TDCJ, with Texas prisons in general. So the idea behind this is to cast a light on those problems, to discuss it, and hopefully to, to uh, get a ball rolling somewhere in this world to uh, address those issues and fix them. That's true. And the, the big thing is that Criminal justice comes up everywhere, not just in the news, but in movies and TV shows. And really, I don't see it presented in the way that I have experienced it when I got locked up. Everything, honestly, was a giant surprise. From dealing with courts to going to prison, everything was totally different than I expected. When I see people talking about it, it's definitely not the way... I've understood it from my experience, and I really would like to present that to other people. And I alone, I feel like, has way more experience than me in this area. And he also has some some great stories that exemplify exactly what we want to talk about. We both have a, a few stories. We want to present that to anyone and everyone. Podcast will have stories. The podcast will have issues. Ryan is full of soapbox. I mean, he is just replete with causes that he wants to champion. He's never met a cause that he didn't like. Uh, There there are a few causes. I guess you're right. But you know what I mean. (laughs) He's an activist at absolute heart in his in his heart and soul he's the real driving force behind what we're doing right now but i believe in it wholeheartedly and that's why i'm here lending my support and, and what help i can give i will say a big part of me being an activist i was not always an activist so i was locked up for intoxicated manslaughter and before my accident that ended up taking someone's life i was not super into activism i was really just super into my career, and that was about it. What happened during my sentencing, first, I pled guilty immediately. I I tried to take as much responsibility as I could. Only reason there was even a sentencing hearing is because I was facing 40 years in prison, and I was going to try and fight for my freedom. That was the only way to do it was to just have a hearing. The prosecutors was not really offering me much. Prosecutor is, you know, the side that is, you know, representing the state and the family, state of Texas at the time. And the, the family is the family of the victim. When that ultimately we had that hearing, the hearing is basically just going in front of the judge, each side. So the prosecutor brought witnesses like the owner of the bar who saw me that night and police officers who, who dealt with me. This was, o- this was only for a sentencing phase, right? Since the guilt was already, the guilt, already pled guilty. I pled guilty like a me. So this was a year, this was a year after the accident. I had pled guilty as soon as I could, which was like, a, so you can't plead guilty right away because there has to be a grand jury has to come together and first say if there's enough 
evidence to see if there was even a crime committed. Yeah, um, to indict you. To indict me, right. So the first phase is always going to be a, a grand jury. So when, anytime you're in the news and you hear about a grand jury, they're just seeing if there's enough evidence to see if there is a crime. All right, that's the first thing. And I'm indicted, which means there's a crime that they say can point towards me as the person who committed that crime, possibly at that point. As soon as that happened, I pled guilty immediately. I said, I did it. It's me. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm pleading guilty. Now, in Texas, at least, it's broken up into two parts. There's the admitting your guilt, and then there's the sentencing part. Some people do there's it. The deter- there's determining guilt. Right. You don't, not everybody goes in there. I didn't go in there and admit my guilt. I lied through my teeth. <laughs> when dealing with the criminal justice system, like especially in Texas, in general, you want to say not guilty just because the next phase is the sentencing phase. So if you say not guilty to start with, that actually gives you room to bargain. And it gives you time. So if I had said not guilty to start with, then the prosecutor could have come back at me and said, all right, if you plead guilty now, I'm going to give you less time. But what I did was, is I said guilty right away. So the prosecutor is like, "Eh, well, I'm just going to throw the max at you. Sounds good. The flip flip side is also true of that as well. If you go in there and you you refuse to plead guilty, well, then the prosecutor says, I'm going to make sure that you get uh, the maximum or or at least a much harsher sentence than you would have gotten otherwise. Right. And the, the prosecutor can, the way I thought about it too, as, as I assume everything is based on the judge. I thought everything like the, you know, I really need to suck up to this judge, but the judge is not determining anything until the very end. Basically what happens is, is like if I took a plea deal, which is a, instead of going in front of the judge and having a hearing to begin with. And I just signed a piece of paper, an agreement with the district attorney to do this much time instead of going to, to trial. The judge would just, just has to agree to that, which they like 99% of the time they do. So really the person who had the most power, who had really who has the most power is going to be the district attorney or whoever your prosecutor is. And there's not usually, there's not one district attorney. In my, in my situation, I didn't deal directly with the district attorney for my county. I dealt with actually a junior district attorney who was, who was really trying to make a name for herself, was trying to move up into, in the ranks, which was definitely not the situation that anyone wants to be in because it doesn't, a district attorney does not look good when they give someone the minimum sentence or they just get probation. It does not look good on the district attorney. What looks good is when they just totally shut out the defense, when they give someone the maximum, when they when they get someone a whole lot of time. That makes the, the district attorney look really good because they're now they're, especially in Texas, because then they're tough on crime. Tough on crime. Yeah. That, that uh, somewhat depends on the county that you're in. True. Uh, it, it, it changes by the county that you're in. But in Texas, in general, it is that way. And the, the, all the bigger counties, I mean, all the biggest counties that we have in, in Texas, Dallas, and the Dallas area, the Houston area, it is certainly that way. It uh, is the, I mean, all the places that have the highest level of death penalty cases, I mean, uh, death penalty uh, uh, convictions in the world, or at least in the United States for sure. And... Strangely enough, they also have the most amount of uh, DNA exonerations. I cannot believe I brought up the death penalty because I. <laughs> <laughs> no, that I mean that that's the not... last thing. That is the last thing I want to talk about on this show. Well, this isn't going to become the prison show where we talk about the death penalty for ninety minutes, but it's a good factor to bring up in Texas, uh, especially around Houston and Dallas. There's a huge level of convictions, a huge level of capital punishments, which is death penalty, and a huge level of exonerations. So they're being super hard on them. And Just DNA exonerations. You have to absolutely be able to prove your innocence to, to, to get one of these exonerations. D- and and D- DNA is one of the very few ways that that happens. There are, there are a couple of, of exceptions to that, but not many. I'd lo- uh, this, this topic, see, we can go on this tangent for a while, because the, and this might be a good future topic, because DNA has been proven very unreliable in a lot of different ways and it can say a lot of different things and and but the Oh the, really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yes, um DNA is 
a lot of um, experts that the um, do not like using DNA because it can it can is very easy to misinterpret the data and it's um, it's it's by no, no means perfect uh, not definitely not as perfect as crime shows lead it up to be and uh, and it's used many times to um, like to convict people uh, they love to go to DNA and it's a and like if you want exoneration using DNA, it's a very expensive process. And the people getting locked up and getting these capital punishments generally don't have a whole lot of money to do do this. Most people right. yeah, getting locked up, they're not gonna not gonna get funds for that, especially since like in Texas, you do not get paid for the work you do when you get locked up. In fact, if you're making money while you're in prison, other than people sending you putting money on your books, um, so you can buy stuff in the prison, like from commissary or phone minutes, then they will punish you for doing that. Really? Yeah. They will. They, if you have like a business, an outside business going or something like that, oh, uh, yeah. it, then you will, they will punish you for that. It, You're right. They will make the attempt. At, well, I mean, they, they will punish you if they find out about it. I've actually met someone who, uh, who beat that and he did it in a very interesting way, but that is a subject for another day. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So like any negotiation, you want to have like something in your back pocket. A lot of times the admission of guilt is something you can use to barter with. I gave that up right away, even though I was trying to, you know, thought it was the right, the moral right thing to do. That was a, that was a big part of the thing is there's just there wasn't much I had to barter with. And there and for the D.A., they're like, there's, you know, I can. I can give you, they're, they're like, I'll, how about 15 years? <laughs> um, and that was about it. There, there was nothing, nothing else. He came to you with 15 years first. I think that's. That was his initial. Uh, that, that was like 15 years. So I, I honestly, it's been a long time. So according to the, for a long time, I'm like, I don't remember ever getting told about 15 years, but supposedly, you know, but I could totally see myself like someone coming up to me and saying 15 years early on and I immediate me immediately saying no, because I was really hoping because the minimum that I could have gotten was two. I had two charges, which were both two to 20 years, which also could have been stacked, which would have led to 40. But, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing. You know, this is a first offense, but I also didn't know that the county I was in, and this is a, this when this is what we were talking about earlier. Different county, each county is different. I was in Collin County. Right next to me was Tarrant County. In Tarrant County, there was a very famous case where a teenager got drunk and drove his car and ended up killing four of the passengers in the car. And his case was dismissed. Basically, his defense attorney argued that he did not know the difference from right from wrong. That got dismissed. He got probation on another charge, and that was it. And he, he did not have to do any time for the people who died due to his drunk driving. They called it affluenza. That was the, the name on the media. Well, I remember that, that case. After you said affluenza, everybody knows that. And six months later, Kid got in trouble again because he was seen on Facebook uh, drinking, violated the probation he was on, and his mom took him and went to Mexico. And that's the last I heard about that case. Well, so he did get, well, he did get some kind of punishment if he was on probation. He was on probation. I don't know if it was for that charge, though, as a, because uh, he did not know right from wrong, which well, was in, insane. That's, that's a whole other problem with Texas prison is the fact that uh, people who have, I mean, that's not just Texas prisons either. That's prison, That's uh, criminal justice in general in the United States of America is susceptible to being uh, bought. Right. I will tell you that was one thing that was mentioned to me a couple of times while I was out on bond was maybe I should slip some money to the judge, which me trying to deal with the fact that I had killed someone and trying to do the moral upright thing in response. It's like, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. And all that kind of stuff. By the way, uh, people who don't know Ryan Forbes as well as I do, Ryan is one of the most upright and upstanding people you will ever meet. He literally has a tattoo saying to live with honor and integrity on his wrist. 
to keep him to constantly remind him of, uh, to do the right thing. I do. And this is the thing that drives me crazy is that dealing with the justice system totally turned me upside down because what ended up happening. And the reason I bring this up is when the sentencing hearing ended up happening, all these things I thought I was doing to present that, that that I am a moral person, and I thought that's what needed to stand. I thought that was what was going to be on trial, was that that Ryan, that is a moral person who contributed to society, and, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to do the next right thing and all that kind of stuff. I thought that's, uh, the, the system would recognize that, and, you know, it's not that I wouldn't be punished, but that it would show it would up. Be, it would be looked at through the lens of, of the person that you are. Yeah, it would, it would be recognized. It would be recognized in that courtroom, I guess, would be the right. biggest thing. And I will tell you what ended up happening in that courtroom that day and during my sentencing. It, it didn't just, it wasn't just that there, you know, I felt like the punishment was unjust or whatever. What happened was I watched... The district attorney, she's trying to make a name for herself. She wants to prove herself. It looks good the more time I get. So she was eviscerating me, and I'm an easy target. I no no doubt. I mean, I killed someone, and I admitted to it. And I'm and I wasn't saying I'm sorry because I'm sitting there saying this is too big. This was this is too big of a thing to to apologize for, and I don't know what to do. So I'm just a deer in the headlights. And she is taking advantage. I'm watching as my family's on one side of the courtroom and this victim's family is on the other side of the courtroom. It is tearing them apart. That did not need to ever happen. That was just harm on top of harm. That feeling that I felt in that courtroom, that just just everyone getting burnt at the same time and just being hurt. And I caused, I started this hurt and then it just, everyone continuing, continuing to get hurt over this. That's where this, I like the soapbox comes from. Like the soapboxes, like I, why I start throwing down soapboxes and wanting to stand on them and why I, I, I wanted to do this podcast and talk about the criminal justice system, because I, I'll say it a million times. I don't want people to do what I did. I made way too many mistakes, so I don't want it to happen again. And I don't want don't want other people to experience it and it shouldn't have to and the only way that you can i mean there's no way that you can put an event like that i mean once you've done something like that like killed somebody you can't go back and not kill somebody no matter how bad you wish you could go back and reverse what you had done the only way forward if there is a way forward is to take that that event that negative thing that whatever it is that someone has done and try to to use that that lesson to to take it and talk about it and, and to try to keep, like you said keep it from ever happening to anyone else again not just the experience you had in the courtroom but but the general experience of of, uh, of your mistakes that you made that led you to that courtroom i i feel that way about my crime my crime was hard it's a, it's a violent crime, and there's a whole lot that goes into it, and uh, that's a story for another day, and maybe we will tell that story someday. But, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I started off my prison career lying myself silly about what happened. Later on in life, you know, after the, there wasn't any reason to lie anymore because, you know, I, wasn't, I had no more appeals or anything like that. Well, then I, you know, I started being forthcoming with what really happened or what, telling the uh, truth that I was guilty of this crime and so forth of, of murder. I realized that as long as I was lying, no good could ever come of that crime. No, nothing good could ever come up. For me to, to, to turn this around, for me to try to, to, to salvage some good from this horrible event is going to require me first and foremost to be honest about it and to, and to open up about it and let other people know, you know, to speak about it. And that's a lot of what we're doing right here, too. Right. Right. You, you have to talk about it to bring something out of it. If you just, if you don't talk about it. I learned that early on because I was in treatment and I went to, was going to 12 step groups and that's how, that's how you deal with everything. You just talk everything out. You talk about, you throw all your baggage on the floor in front of everybody. And then you find out real quick that it actually helps people because it lets, uh, lets other people know that they, when they're dealing with something similar, that there helps them deal with it. And on, on the flip side of it, there's I don't see any representations of what we were seeing portrayed in any sort of media. I've seen sort of there there have been close ones. There there have been some um, some. What do you mean? The closest one I can think of is like maybe ear hustle. Like they'll they'll talk about what happens inside, but they're talking about what happened in like San Quentin. And the reason that ear hustle even exists is because they have like a a, a journalist who comes in 
started a podcasting workshop inside the prison and they are allowed to record it not only with permission of the warden but they have an officer a lieutenant come in and do the sign off every episode giving his permission which can you imagine that happening at a, at a Texas prison no exactly like i just a journalist you, wants getting me, getting journalists inside of Texas prisons is nigh unto impossible in right the modern day and age the only way a journalist is coming into a prison is if they're going to film a religious, like a Christian ceremony, like some sort of Christian event. And they, and if the church that funds it is spending a whole bunch, like puts a whole bunch of pressure outside of it. It's the only way any sort of media is coming on to, the, to a prison. I'm sure you can ask journalists about this. But like the deal, like Texas prisons are a black hole for them. They don't have access, and we've been in there, and and we've seen it. And, I mean, it's it's actually gotten much better. It really was. I mean, it used to be an absolute just I, total isolation from everybody, and they control every single uh, method by which anybody would be able to communicate with the outside. They still do that, but they have many more avenues of communication available now. I mean, they have the phones and, and that type of thing, and they're getting tablets now. Not in the past, it was, ugh, in the past, it was, it was nothing but mail and you had a mail room full of book burners. So you still have a book. You decide whether or not you're allowed to, to receive a letter or to send one out, depending on what it says in there. And what Malone means by book burners is it's very accurate. There's a mail, any, all mail comes to the mail room. All right. Let, let's be clear. When you're inside prison, nothing is private. Everything is out in the open. Sleep. No so, secrets. Yeah, and there's, no, there's absolutely no secrets. You are surrounded by people at all times. There's zero privacy. And then any mail that comes in gets searched by the mail room. Read by the people in the mail room. Read by the people in the mail room, maybe. Very early on, my ex-wife wrote me a letter. The first page of the letter was denied and the rest of it because it was written on um, notebook paper got approved and got to me so I got to read the last part of the letter I was really upset about that because I really wanted to hear from her and we had been trying to get back together before prison and she I I get this and I look at it and I find out from the context that her mom had just died and that was on the first sheet I'm like what the so I go to the mail room the next day and I'm like, I got this. You said this is denied. How could this possibly be denied? I'm like, and I explain what, what happened that she was writing me about her mom dying. They go through and look at it again and they said, we can't give it to you. It's not approved, but we'll, we're going to mark, we're going to give you a copy and mark out the, the obscene section. The obscene section was She'd written it on stationery that had a picture of a statue that was naked. And a statue? Do you mean like a classical, you know, type it, of? It, it, it was, yeah, it was like a Greek statue. It was, a, I'll grant it, it was a drawing of a statue, but it was clearly a statue. It was not like it was not anatomically perfect. So, something that nowhere else in the modern world would consider pornography. Right. No. Yeah. That's absolutely not. They. They. You could show it you know, in prime time, no problem. They took a marker and crossed out the boobs, which drew more attention to the boobs than than the letter did. That was actually an act of mercy on their part because the policy is they don't even do that. Right, I know. they. It was an act of mercy. And that's, I think the only reason I got that letter is because when I explained to them, I'm like, look, like, this is about someone. This, also, they messed up. You Like, you understand what happened. My my ex wife had written that someone had died and they didn't call me in. Right, they had messed up too on the policy. If a loved one or family member dies, they are supposed to contact you for handing you the letter. They're supposed to contact you and call you in because they don't want you freaking out in the middle of the day room. Which yeah, I, people they, have have uh, extreme emotional responses to that type of thing. It can be dangerous. Right, and that usually they'll have like the chaplain go over the news with you or. Or however that goes, and the day room. Just so everyone knows, what uh, is a day room, Ryan? <laughs> you you have to know how the prisons are set up. Each prison in in Texas, every prison is set up differently, and I'm sure in other states they're set up totally differently too. There's in your cells where inmates sleep. They can be some of them have bars, some of them just have doors, and some of them. You don't even have bars or doors. You don't even have cells. You sleep in cubicles. You, you know, you've just got a bunk 
inside of a cubicle and they're all piled in next to each other. And then there's a separate room where inmates can go where there's the TVs and tables that are usually cemented down into the floor so no, uh, nobody can pick up the table and throw it at anyone or anything like that. Solid, solid stainless steel tables. Right. Or if it's an older unit or an older part of a unit, it can be there'll be a, a, a wrought iron table with a concrete with a two inch thick concrete top. Yuck. In other words, you know they're 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 pretty hard and unforgiving, and uh, and they're just used to play dominoes on and for people to sit around. And- uh, yeah. Writing letters or drawing pictures. Which if you sit on that for a long period of time, your back will feel it. It is uh oh, yeah. it it is uncomfortable. And I have done hours and hours of writing on those tables and writing and drawing and uh that yeah, that was uh not fun for my back. Yeah, and then on top of it, you're going to have you're usually gonna have two TVs in the day room that are usually on full blast. And even though you're sitting right in front of them, you can't hear them, but you can definitely hear them from the hallway. Very strange phenomenon in prison. Can't hear the TVs directly in front of them in the day rooms. He was absolutely right. It's like something, something it's like the, what do they call that? Uh, the, the effect that they have in those symphony halls and all that, where like a sound wave has to happen. The things are up. The TVs are up full blast, but you can't hear them where you're sitting. Everywhere else that doesn't want to hear them can't do anything but hear them. Over their radio, over their headphones and everything. Well, and a big part of that is it's almost as if TZs were not designed to work like that. And it's a, a big part of it is because a lot of the times the, the, the TVs are not like when you put a TV in your home, which is how they are designed, you put it on a wall in your living room and then you put the – and you're supposed to put the couch where you watch it from, the diagonal distance plus half. That's how far away your um, your couch is supposed to be. So if you have a 72-inch TV, then your TV should be, so half of 72 is uh, 36. So it should be 108 inches away from the TV, which ends up being, what, um, about six feet. So it should be about six feet away. And, but... In prison, the benches are like two feet away, and though though the TV is if you're over on uh, if you're over on that seven and eight dorm where we were, they're even it can be even closer and closer together. That's true. Yes, because there's not a, your day room is your those living. were redesigned. Those those were dorms weren't originally meant to be dorms. They were repurposed to be dorms from g- gymnasiums and cow halls and that type of thing from the 30s right and and like yeah they were everything was jam-packed in there so you've got your tvs just hanging over you and um and there's nothing behind the tvs so the the instead of the sound bouncing off the back wall and then coming back to hit you the sound just goes back and so that's why you can usually hear it out in the hallway crystal clear but then you don't. You're sitting right in front of it, and you have to hold up your ear to the TV to hear the words. The best part is, like in seven and eight dorm, it's you're gonna, the TV's gonna be on full blast, and people are gonna be sleeping right next to it too. Trying to sleep. Trying to sleep, right? Or if you're like me, you've gotten used to it, and you were able to sleep through it. True. Yeah, that and that takes some. Take some skill, and for me, take some uh, time and some earplugs. The other thing is that is also where that day room where those TVs are blasting, uh, usually there is a phone right behind the TV <laughs> or right in the general area. So there, They will be in the day room area. Yeah, so it's going to be in the day room. That's where you go to use the phones, too. There's usually going to be a long line because – there's usually only going to be one phone for every 50 or 60 inmates. And uh, it's going to be a, and that is, besides the mail, that is going to be your main source of contact with the outside world. And because everyone works for the day without pay, uh, everyone usually works from eight to five. uh, Slavery, slave labor. Right. Call it what it is. Uh, And we can go, well, we're going to have a whole nother episode to, we're gonna to, have a lot of episodes about that once I get on that soapbox. Yeah, we we're gonna talk about what 
like what working in prison is like and why we're saying it's slave labor. And you're and anyone is welcome to say, you know, to argue that point with us. But we're we'll we will make our case. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> exactly. Um, but everyone comes back at five. So at five, um, if you want that phone, a lot of people will come right through that door and go right to the phone and grab it. And then that phone is until the phones turn off at 10 o'clock. Uh, it, it's lines of people trying to get on that phone. Uh, one phone for about 30 inmates. So, okay. Yeah. You, know, you, you got to imagine it's a, uh, and the phone calls are what? 20 minutes, 15 minutes a piece. Do the math from five o'clock till 10 30 or no, actually the phones went off at 10 o'clock. Didn't they? they? They went off to four, 30 minutes before rec time. So you had five hours and with approximately, you know, so many people, look, look, look. And it, uh, you can, see, you can imagine it's a jam pack. And a lot of guys are trying to double up and get more than one phone call and that type of thing. Right. And their girlfriend, their mom, and, you know, someone else, their homeboy that got out of prison. The, all three of those people need to be called. And the TVs and the phones, those are good places where fights can break out. And, um, that's not. I got a fight behind the TV. Yeah. I mean, that TV yeah. is an easy, super easy. That is the place where you're going to see the most fights like break out. I didn't even change TVs. the channel. Right. And it was just on a cartoon, and they assumed because I draw comic books, it must have been me that changed it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> kind of funny. Yeah. Kind of funny now. Yeah, it's funny now. The one thing to know, too. I wonder when I was on medium custody. Yeah, no. Uh, oh, so there's two things there. One thing about the TVs is that the TVs. What is medium custody, Ryan? I'm going to get into medium custody. I, want, I just want to quickly add this just because I. it's always, this blew my mind when I first came in. The TVs are on sports and movies, right? You can change the movie TV, but if you touch that sports TV, there will usually be hell to pay. Uh, That's it's, exactly what would happen in my case. Somebody changed the sports TV to cartoons. Right. And I, and I, and part a big part of that reason is because of gambling. Gambling that, <laughs> and many times even the, the officers are on. They'll, they'll tell you that we, you know, they don't support gambling or anything like that. But they have no problem making sure the game is on, and they'll even ex- like make it a late night rack if there's a good game on that night. But far be it if there's a good movie on, because that's not happening. Sports are sacred in prison. If Dallas is playing that night, you're getting a late night rack. That that's how that's how it goes. Playoff games are generally allowed to people are generally allowed to stay up late, and certainly any kind of well, you know, you're not going to have a championship game on late, so you don't have to worry about that. Right. All right. Now we want, let's talk about custody levels. You start off at um, you know general your general population custody level, but um, when you are they have new names for them now. It's like S. Four S two S one, all that type of stuff. And yep. I still don't understand all that, but I, I it, that's not what it used to be called. It used to be called line class and and all that type of stuff. The custody levels are the G four and, and and that type of thing. Right. Those are the G, those are the G letters, whatever that stands for. And then the uh, your class uh, has something to do with your custody level. Is the S four S one line one line two line three. They did not change that. That is still the same. The custody levels they changed. They used to be close custody, medium custody, medical custody, and of course, administrative segregation. Right. Or the only other custody level that they had other than that was uh, was protective custody. Those are the those were the ma- major. Those were all the custody levels they had in Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And then Texas Seven happened. And when Texas Seven happened, and those guys broke out, and, and what was it? late 2000 the first thing everybody asked was is okay well you know these guys were minimum because they, they they told them well they were minimum custody inmates and they're like you had all these people with life sentences no, no wonder they broke out they were minimum custody and the sound of that minimum custody made it sound like they weren't being guarded properly like they were being you know like they were trustees and being allowed to roam around outside the fence and that's how they broke out 
which wasn't the case. It was just uh, how it made it sound. So they changed, instead of actually changing anything that was real, they just changed the name of it so that if anybody else broke out that was already in minimum custody, now they were a G, G2 and <laughs> instead of minimum custody. I have written up here that we definitely, we have an episode about can you get locked up in prison? This is exactly what I've I want to talk about. So I think on that episode, we definitely need to talk about different custody levels. We're going to, we'll break those down. We will break down what we also need to break down the Texas seven because the Texas seven. We still need to explain what minimum custody or medium custody or all that. Medium custody is is where you go when you get locked. The first place you go when you get locked up in prison. So if you basically, so you can get cases in prison. All right. Cases, everyone gets Disciplinary actions. Disciplinary actions. And, and they have a, they actually will have a hearing and everything. Right. And and your hearing is in the middle of the night, generally. It, no, it's, not always. Depends. Yeah. Not, the, the, the major cases won't be. The major cases will all be, always probably be in the morning. Well, fortunately, I never got a major case. So that I didn't have to experience that. But ah. yeah, so I've only had to deal with being woken up in the middle of the night or or this maneuver, which was awesome, get called out right before count. That, they love that. Gosh, they love that so much. Yeah, when you get counts, we got it. All right. So one thing is when I say get called what out. What is a count, man? A count is they have to count you all the time, all day long. They are going to count. How many, time, they, how many times do they count you in prison on a daily basis? I think it was eight times a day. I think I went through it one time and tried to count how many times a day they call it. It's eight times, twice a shift. Yeah, I think that's that's or no, yeah. So, uh, I think it might even be more than that. It, well, that's not including special counts. Um, special counts are sometimes on holidays and stuff like that. So, well, special count is when they just say we're just going to count right now just because, and they do that for just sometimes they just need an extra count. They need to do a certain number of count special counts each year, but on holidays. They actually add more counts to the day because because inmates more often commit suicide around the holidays. You know, yeah, holiday spirit. So so they do more counts to make sure inmates are still alive. It was what they're supposed to do. But that what a lot of times that yeah, may, the, the inmates in general aren't working as well. So you know, it, a lot of the the way that they've designed or 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 done the counts is kind of around the busier times of the day. I think at night they do a count every other hour. I think every other hour on the, on the uh, night shift, they actually do a count. I think that's how it is on the holidays. You just don't hear it because they don't ring the bells or the alarms and all that during the nighttime. You're right. You are you are right that they do that. Oftentimes the guard doesn't even count because they know nobody's gone anywhere. They'll just mark down a piece of paper the same as it was the hour before and hand it in. And then when something happens and they forget to mark some, someone who's moved, they get in trouble for it. We're getting close to time and let's, let's talk like, about it. You still haven't explained what medium, medium custody, custody is. is. Medium custody is when, so if you get three cases, that goes major. Three minor cases. Three minor cases. So a major case is fighting. Explain what a minor case is. All right. A minor case, one of my my first minor case was missing a mailroom lay in, which is if you have to go, gosh, we're going into everything now. The mailroom is where the mail comes in. They call you in to get, if you get like a book or something, they're going to call you in. The night before, they send you a slip of paper that allows you to leave at a certain time because you can't just leave the cell block whenever you want. You have to have an official lay in is what it's called. They'll right. actually say lay in on the piece of paper. Right. They'll say lay in and then you can show that to the officer. And if they are willing to listen to that lay in, they'll let you out the door. But sometimes they will say, no, you have to be called out for that lay in. And you'll argue with them and it will do you no good. And you'll just have to sneak your way out, which that's something we can cover in another episode. So I forgot about a uh, lay-in I was supposed to go to, and I got written up for that. That's a minor case, you know, no big deal. And you'll get some sort of reprimand. I don't know. I couldn't go to rec for a week, go outside and lift weights and stuff like that. I wasn't allowed on the rec yard for a week. And if I had gone to the rec yard, that would have been another minor case. And would have been another punishment. If I had done it twice, I would have been three cases 
that that case right there would have gone major. Major case, now I'm facing going to medium custody. Medium custody is where you get sent, sent off and you're separated from the general population inmates. You're in your cell pretty much all day. You do have day room times, so they'll, they will basically pull you certain cells out and take you to the day room at certain times. They will take you to rec at certain times if you have that permission. Some medium custody inmates do not. And you will just sit there basically in your cell most of the time. Like when you go to lunch, like to, to meals and stuff like that, you're separated from other inmates. You also have a lot less access to phones. You have that, uh, you have yeah. reduced access. You don't get contact visits anymore with yeah. your family. No more contact visits. You can't spend as much money on commissary. You're not allowed. To, oh, you and can't. You're, you're probably going to be on restriction for the first two months you're over there anyways if you had a minor ca- uh, major case. Yeah, you'll be on restriction, which like commissary, you can buy. Commissary is where you can buy certain items and like you can buy tortilla chips and refried beans and candies and cookies and whatever they have on they sell. And some necess- some necessities like uh, shampoo and deodorant. Shampoo and deodorant and, uh, and drawing paper and pens and pencils and things like that. Right, but right. It, if you're on restriction, though, you can't buy most of that. You can buy one bottle of maybe shampoo. Um, you can buy soap. You can buy a toothbrush. Or no, you can't buy. Yes, you can buy a toothbrush, but you're given a toothbrush anyway. What, Our, what do they call it? They call it hygiene items and, and, uh, and, and correspondence. Uh, Correspondence, that's what it was. Yeah. Correspondence. So you can buy envelopes and, and um, a certain number of stamps because stamps are currency in prison. So you can only buy a certain number of them because they know we will we can use them to trade for those chips and things that, you know, those good items, the good good. You can trade almost anything for <laughs> Oh yeah, you could tra- you could trade toilet paper, which some people do, and it's questionable. That could be an interesting subject for a future date. This was the prison economy. Prison economy is a great one, and I know we've got some great stories, especially since I work supply, and I got to see a lot of that. True, so, never did get me one of those red cups I was looking for. I don't think I ever got access to the red cups. I, well, I'll, you'll have to remind me what the red cups or the, were. Or the the black cups. Is it? Those oh, cups they had, no, they no. were handing out to everybody, but I couldn't get one. Right. Yeah. No, the black cups. I wanted one of those black cups too, and I couldn't get it for a long time until later on. I was about, I had one for you, then COVID hit. And that's something else we want to talk about is definitely want to talk about COVID in prison and how that all went down at Stringfellow because that was a real fun, <laughs> that was fun for everybody. Especially, I can't wait to talk about that. I got a story to tell with that one. I want to hear that. Poor Bornstein almost died over there. <sighs> yeah, you know all about that. That was crazy. I could, like, I w- I was over at the trustee camp at the time, which I'll have to explain trustee camps at a different time because we're getting close. I'm isolated, all on my own, almost at another unit, pretty much, and then finally, restrictions lift up enough that I can go back to the building. I go back. I I see Malone, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Oh yeah, Bornstein almost died." I'm like, what? And it's like, yeah, and this person's gone, and this person's gone, and meet this guy. And I'm like, what the heck happened over here? Because we couldn't move. <laughs> like, most yeah. ever, we were, like, locked down that entire time. And all of a sudden, like, everything's different over where you were at. So that was that was crazy. That was a very uh, erratic period of time. That was unusual in every respect. Yeah, there's a lot of good stories to tell from that period. I mean, you talked about how you got me out, how you were instrumental in getting me out of prison. Literally, as they shut the phones off and locked down the unit for COVID, you gave me the vital piece of information I needed to get myself out. Yes, that is a whole episode I want onto its own because what. We went through to get you out. That was a miracle, and I'm not taking any responsibility for that because... Well, you, you played your part for sure because uh just so apparent that it was a miracle by the fact that the, the timing of which it happened. I mean, a minute more and it wouldn't have happened. Right. We're going to talk about that. And this is one of the things, as we're wrapping it up right now, I really want to tell everyone is that the criminal justice system is not like a well-oiled machine where everything happens the same and it's based on some sort of logic or whatever. There is so much luck and happenstance and things that just collide. You don't see that. You, 
you don't see how these things come together. And you don't see how just this one little thing over here affects so many different things. And that is what I would really like to, one of the many things I would like to show on here. And one of the biggest things that I would like to see is that just watching an episode of Law & Order, what, what you learn from watching that, even if you don't even realize it, that one thing is affecting a hundred other things in the background because you're yeah. making a whole bunch of assumptions off of that. About, um, what, about the people that are in prison and so forth. You're right. That's a good that's a very good point that you're making. Thing, yeah, what would you like to say before we call this one a day? We were all over the place on this one. We were trying to just introduce y'all, introduce the world to the concept of this uh, of this podcast and what we're all about and what we'll be talking about in the future, which is going to be all about these crazy incongruencies and, and illogic and ironies and everything else that go into Texas prison and the injustice that's being done to some people and the, and, and the just insane opposite of that, the, the mercy that's given to others over and over again. That's what I'll be here to talk about. And to tell you a bunch of stories about my 30 years of incarceration. Yes, yes. Lots of interesting stories to tell. Grandpa Paul Malone. <laughs> well, uh, the prison historian will start talking. The idea for this podcast, the whole idea for it, I had this while I was in prison listening to one of Grandpa Malone's stories. I was like, no one hears stories like this. And it was because I was like, it was so much, it's fun to listen to. It. It's fun to hear them and listen to them and, and learn from them. I don't know why they don't tell these actual stories because they're way crazier than a lot of the, than the stories they do tell. And there's a lot more depth to them. There's just so much more going on. And I really want to get, like I've, I've told you before, there's the one story about the escape that I want to talk about. I want you to tell so badly. But we're going to get to that another day. I'm really excited about this podcast. I can't wait to do the next one. Just got our new setup here. Really excited to get this out there. I can't wait to see what it looks like. You guys have been listening to The Shakedown. And uh, we will talk to you next week. Bye.